Hello. Hello. How you doing, man? Uh, doing great, as always. Schedule cucking myself. Uh, also, as always. How you doing? Good. <laughs> well, uh, I'm sorry for the mix-up, but uh, I'm glad we're still able to swing this, man. You don't need to apologize, right? This is literally 100% on me. Um, hold on. Let me activate the Mario. Very good. All right. Um, how have you been? It's been a while since we talked. Been good. Um... I just actually, like, uh, earlier this month, started a Twitch channel because I was thinking, hey, this would be a good way to help rope more people into yelling at each other on Discord. Based. Um, and it's been kind of successful. Like, I was surprised. But um, <laughs> first thing, I, I just got to ask you, um, I, I haven't actually figured this out. Uh -huh. How did your charity stream get negative attention? <laughs> I heard someone smeared it. Oh, well, I mean, there were, like, right-wing Zionist types who smeared it, of course, because they were saying the money oh, was going Jesus. to Hamas. And then there are people who just generally don't like me. Altogether, though, I really can't complain. The overall reception was pretty positive. You know, I feel really good about all how it all went. Yeah, what was it, 294,000? Yeah, thereabouts. Um, and the... Um, the donation is, is being sent right now. My bank really didn't like me suddenly moving that much money around, you know? The, my bank, uh, <laughs> yeah, they uh, they saw me venting. They called sus, so I, I had to call a couple times and work things out. But it, it seems like everything's worked out and the money's on its way. Um, so I'm looking forward to the receipt getting posted so that people can stop saying that I'm, like, running off to Aruba with all the money. Well, I mean, you know, congrats on that. I don't think anyone should have a... Uh gripes or complaints about money being given to help Palestinian children. Hopefully. Um, you'd think. That'd be <laughs> that'd be ideal, right? If we could find that common ground at least. But, you know, it's, it's some people with some wacky opinions out there. <laughs> but yeah, again, uh, congrats on that. So, on the off chance anyone doesn't know, we're here with Vosh, uh, Twitch streamer extraordinaire. I think pretty much all you guys know him now. If you don't, you must be new to debate Discord. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's see. Let's get to the questions then. Absolutely. Hit me up. It's been a while since I've done uh, an AMA. I feel replete with answers. <laughs> so, first one, I'm curious. Um, we've got that debate coming up next Saturday. Um, how do you prepare for a debate? Do you typically just wing it? Uh, do you actually, you know, look into the other side? Um, I mean, it really depends on who I'm debating. Who am I debating next? You're gonna have to have a couple of balls in the air right now. Help me out. You're on Brooke. Yes. Um, with with people like that, obviously, I think it's it's prescient to look at like their past history with debates and the ways in which they tend to argue their points. For the most point, uh, for the most part, though, with debates, I try to not do too much of that. One of the big, uh, I guess, um, one of the the premises I really like to defend is the idea that if you're on the left, for the most part, the arguments you're going to be facing are so bad that you don't actually need to prepare to uh, step up against them. You don't need to have some like crazy in-depth understanding of the subject. Usually just a basic understanding of the subject, as long as like a handy internal archive of the ways in which people will dick you about during debates. That's usually enough, I think, to get you through most disagreements with the, with the right. So... That's what I try to land on. Um, obviously, it varies depending on the person I'm talking to. If I'm speaking to, like, an economist, for example, even if they're right-wing, I, I, I have to be careful because that stuff gets pretty complicated. Right, that's kind of like if you're debating uh, a communist, you just read uh, the Communist Manifesto, right? Yeah, exactly, and you instantly notice, hey, Karl Marx, when he said right here that the proletariat are all nicer people than the bourgeois, that's not necessarily true. Communism debunked. The bunk. All right. Uh, next question we've got here uh, from Quit That Stalin. What are your thoughts on revolutions such as in Rojava? Um, I think that, I mean, I'm a pragmatist in this respect. Unfortunately, the problem is that as time goes on, revolutions become less and less politically viable for a couple of reasons. First of all, people's lives are more comfortable, which means they're less likely to be willing to risk death to achieve a different political system. Like, take America, for example. Even poor people in America have pretty stable lives compared to what people lived 300 years ago. Significantly more stable. 
So that disinclines people from that kind of participation. Additionally, militaries have grown stronger and more centralized, more difficult to deal with with civilian armaments. So in many ways, revolutions are much less practical. In instances where revolutionary activity can be conducted in ways that actually benefit the population, make people's lives better, and it's a, you know, promising potential, I don't have anything necessarily against them. I just think that lefties tend to idealize the aesthetic of revolution, even if it's like super impractical, which can be counterproductive, you know? Uh, next question. Why does everyone call you Vouch? <laughs> Um, I don't know, but it's kind of funny, right? Let's just keep, let's keep it that way, okay? I, I still don't know how that started, but I like it, so let's not mess with it. Uh, Shadow Wolf wants to know, what do you think about Australia? Um, I actually visited Australia <laughs> back when I was 13. My, my uh, parents had some family friends over there. Um, I wouldn't believe it existed were it not for, you know, the time that I actually went there. It's devastatingly hot. I mean, disgustingly hot over there. And all the cicadas and the horse flies and the spiders. Um, folks are nice, though. Food's disgusting. I mean, arguably worse than British food. And that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, Tan wants to know, is the U.S. the greatest country in the world? No, the U.S. is not the greatest country in the world. Well, then what? <laughs> um... I think it's kind of a false premise. If you're trying to describe, like, the worth of human civilization through statehood, I think you've already kind of missed the point. Um, there's also no holistic way to describe the worth of a country. I mean, what are you really measuring? America's the wealthiest country on Earth. We have that going for us. That's certainly impressive, but I don't know if that's necessary the metric for something being the greatest. I don't know what the greatest man or woman to have ever lived would be either. It's, it's sort of a flawed question. All right. Uh, next question is from Karma Reaper. Uh, they ask Vosh, why does the online left hate you so much? Um, you can trace it back to a couple of things. There are actually a few distinct points of contention that led to this point. Um, most of the hate that I get from the online left, I'm pretty sure, is because of me being anti Bernie or Bust. That was the big turning point. Before that, the people who disliked me, it was mostly like the like not to be dismissive, but like the Tumblr type people, you know, like the sensitive lefties. Love them or hate them. It was mostly those people. But um, after I went really hard in the Bernie or Bust arc, it seems like the hatred comes from all sides now. So, you know, I think that's probably the main thing. Next question is from Barn L. In your view, is there a difference between inaction and action? For example, if I did not help a person who was drowning... Is that different from pushing someone into the water? Um, yeah, it, it's, it absolutely is. And I think, I mean, what we're really talking about here is um, obligatory versus supererogatory ethics. Um, it's not just what must one do. It's what should a person do that they mustn't do. Utilitarianism doesn't really distinguish between the two. In practice, I think the more helpful question is... How can you encourage people to act their best? What are the lines you should set for people to encourage them to be their best selves? And the, the line, you should not push people to their death, I think that's a pretty easy one. That's a very clear line, easy to follow, easy to punish people if they don't obey. But to what extent should people sacrifice themselves to help others? That's a tough one. So say you can quickly jump into like a, 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 a river and save a drowning child with no risk to yourself. Is it wrong to not do that? I'd say so, sure. But what if it only cost you $25 to donate to some charity and save the life of some kid in Africa? Well, that's also pretty easy to do, actually. Um, in fact, depending on how expensive the clothes you're wearing are, it might actually be cheaper to do that than to jump into a river. Is it essentially allowing a person to be murdered to not do that in the way that it would be if you just let a kid drown in the river and didn't do anything? I don't know the answer to those questions. All I know is that there's probably social utility to treating the act of murder directly differently than we treat people's indifference towards saving life. There's probably some benefit to distinguishing those behaviors. So just going a little further on that, what are your thoughts on the idea of a moral duty? Do people ever have a moral duty to do anything? 
Uh, yeah, I have to believe that, right? Um, I'd be a pretty bad utilitarian otherwise. Um, but I think, like, I don't think there's an objective moral um, duty or responsibility. I just think that it's important to set them because they're a good way of mandating ethical human behavior. I don't know if there's written into, like, the fabric of the universe, if there's, like, the ideal amount any individual human should do to make other people's lives better. I don't know if that exists. But I think that if we arrive at some arbitrary social determinations, you know, make some inferences, make some guesses, we can probably get good behavior out of people. Better than we could if we said, no, there's no responsibility to your fellow man at all. Oh, anything right. past Next that, and we're well oh. past my understanding of normative ethics. <laughs> or anything for, we're already we're already at the absolute limit of that, you know. All right. Next question is from Musty. He writes, "If I remember correctly, you are a huge fan of democracy, but isn't democracy mob rule?" To bring up an old quote, "Democracy is two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for lunch." I mean. I don't, so this could be a fascist critique or an anarchist critique, kind of. Authoritarians will say stuff like this to say like, hey, you know, democracy and authoritarianism, we're not so different. It's really just about who you're putting in charge of who else. And anarchists will say that even democracy is a form of authoritarianism because um, you're ultimately, you know, you're just choosing who to put in charge of you. Um, I don't think that democracy is just mob rule. Uh, I don't I don't think that's the case. Um I think that democracy is functionally the best opportunity we have to ensure people's individual freedom from authority because it gives people the greatest degree of control that they can possibly have over anything even remotely resembling civilized society. If you get past that and you go down to like, uh, you know, every man individual autonomy no matter what type dealio, um, you start running into issues with positive freedom. Maybe nobody's enacting control on you, but how much power do you have to live the life you want to live? if you don't live in a system with a government that's capable of mandating the behavior of millions of people. Could you, for example, have laws outlawing murder? Could you have laws outlawing rape? Are you really free in the absence of those laws? Maybe there's no government controlling you, but anyone could at any point in time come up and rob you of everything with no recourse or prevention. That's not real freedom. I guess the real answer is that there's no way to secure absolute freedom. It's not even a real thing. Uh, positive and negative freedoms trade off with one another, and it's just about finding a balance that maximizes them. Uh, another question from Musty. How would your system, market socialism, address the economic calculation problem? Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't fix that problem. You would need... The, market socialism would be the transitionary step to arrive at better solutions in the future. The goal of market socialism would essentially be to secure a worker's state, or a proletarian state, as you would. Um, ensuring the elimination of the bourgeois as an economic class because there is no one who singly owns the means of production. I think that environment would allow us a better vantage point from which to address things like the economic calculation problem. All right. Uh, Cthulhu wants to know, what is the biggest obstacle for leftists in the current political climate? <laughs> um, God... I have so many always online answers I want to say, you know, like, uh, ah, the biggest obstacle is that we, oh god, I just lost my, oh no, oh, you know, like, oh, the biggest obstacle is that we, um, we, we've, we've forgotten how to speak to the common man or something like that. Um, I don't, <sighs> hmm. I think the biggest obstacle to leftists is that a lot of leftists have given up on trying to move liberals over. Um, and I think that's a big problem. A lot of lefties forget, like, there's power in numbers, right? How many people in America are actual socialists? <laughs> what? I, 1% might be charitable there. I'd be surprised if it was that many. Maybe you have a lot of, like, soak dams, but real socialists? No. You need numbers. But a lot of leftists get caught up in these... Okay. These highly insular communities. So that's something we need to work on. All right, so I know this is playing off a meme, but Pure Ideology asks, what are your thoughts on the idea that socialism comes into contradiction with human nature? Um, this is usually, like, followed up with some, like, humans are naturally greedy line. Um, I think that this stems from a fundamental misunderstanding of how governments and societies in general operate. Building a functional society government, economy, whatever, is all about incentive structures, okay? I don't think that humans are inherently good or bad. I think that humans are bricks of clay, very malleable ones, and we'll do what we need to survive. Or at least, we'll do what we need to meet 
the biological functions that we were evolved to need to handle, the biggest of which is survival. Social acclimation also being a pretty big one. And the problem is, capitalism doesn't do this for a lot of people. If you take a hard look at how the economy works right now, do you really think that this economy is structured in a way to maximize the incentive structure for the average worker? No, it's not. The average worker doesn't take any proceeds from the business they work for. They're not really incentivized to work harder, to put that much effort in, to care about their environment or their surroundings, because everything is oriented against that. It's a hard, cool, or cruel, uncalculating uh, machine in which they're just a part. So I don't think this incentivizes spectacular behavior from them at all. Now, take a worker cooperative. You put in hard work, you make the business do better, you directly see the results. That's human incentive right there. That gets people working. I think that the human nature argument is one that socialists have always had the upper hand on. It's just a matter of using it properly. Uh, Nanimator wants to know, do you believe the Gulf War was justified? <laughs> um, showing my age a little bit here, but I don't know that much about the Gulf War. Um, since it took place before my time and people don't talk about it that much. I'm gonna take a wild guess though, just, you know, off the cuff and say, probably not, you know? That's just a complete guess, but... I have a feeling that it probably, uh, probably wasn't. A uh, question from Hal. How does it make you feel when people tell you to cut contact with friends of yours, such as, for example, Shu? Um, I understand where the desire comes from to an extent, because there is a problem online with people who will purport to believe certain things, but then they'll go and hang out with people with harmful views that contradict those values. That does happen a lot. I don't really think that's applicable in this case, because I've had multiple public disagreements with Shu, and I mean, I talk with her privately if we disagree on something. So I think it's kind of misguided, and I think it comes down to like, I think it comes down to parasocial bullshit, fundamentally. I think a lot of people like want to believe that I'm like, you know, the super cool guy they can trust, but if they don't like Shu, then that's a threat to their relationship with me, you know, in a sort of indirect um, patron patronage type way. It's very, very frustrating. Um, but it's totally okay if people don't like Shu on head. Um, though so many criticisms against her are so um, inaccurate. There are so many better things to criticize her on than the things that people like land on. The like um, grifter, reactionary type thing. These are very um, insubstantial criticisms. Uh, I think the easiest criticisms, honestly, is the main one, really, is just that Shu um, likes being able to goof and pal around with the people in her community, and if the left gets a little bit too morally puritanical for her, she'll, like, tr drop um, good optical uh, progressivism in favor of trashing those people pretty easily. And... Um, and sometimes that can have like a blowback that leads to her like at least optically adopting some reactionary positions. I don't think that makes her a reactionary. I just wish people criticized her for the things she actually does wrong, you know? All right. Uh, let's see. How Nanimator wants to know how should slurs be treated in society? Um, probably, probably shouldn't say them, right? Tactically or otherwise. Um, think of it as a manners thing more so than anything else, you know? Um, manners are important because they're a way of showing people around you that you're capable of adhering to social demands, even if they're arbitrary. So, say, putting your elbows up on the table. Now, when you're around friends, do you need to do this? Uh, keep the elbows off the table? Probably not, no. But if you're in good company, you try to. Why? What does it mean? Well, all it really means is that you can follow instructions, but it's important to be able to show people you can do that because if you can't follow good manners, you're probably also going to act in a socially deviant way in other respects. I'll give you another example. This is perhaps a better one, okay? You know what? Uh, a lot of what um, people call creepy behavior really is just basic manners. Not leering at women on public transit, for example. Not making comments about their body. Now, these things aren't directly... Uh, harmful in the sense that you can like measure empirical harm from them apart from perhaps discomfort in some instances but it's important when people engage in that behavior to take note and to caution against it because if a guy can't stop from leering at a woman on public transit he probably also lacks the self-control to do worse things 
Manners are a litmus test we use to determine whether or not people are safe to be around, if that makes sense. And it works with the slurs too. Does saying a slur inherently mean you're racist or whatever? No, I don't think so. But if you insist on saying them, and you don't acquiesce to other people's requests to not say them, that's pretty indicative of some other biases you might have. And that's why I think it's important. Astro2998 wants to know, is Christianity a true religion? I don't... I, don't, I mean, it, it meets the definition of a, of a religion, no? I suppose by I that so. metric... Yeah, so I suppose by that metric, sure. If you were asking me if I believe it's 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 the mythological premises are true, then no, I don't believe that. But I don't know. There's some like really cool churches, right? That stuff's cool. You guys heard it here from Vosh. Christianity is the true religion. I was well. Hold on. There are plenty of really cool <laughs> synagogues and mosques and temples and what have you. There's a lot of cool stuff all over the place. We're not we're not uh, excluding. You know, there was actually a synagogue in the neighborhood that I grew up on that my parents would take us to sometimes because they had a beautiful, beautiful garden. When we were little kids, we'd run around, you know? And um, and they had, like, you know, like flowers and a little swing set and stuff. I remember that being a very, very nice building. Hmm. Uh, Astro also wants to know, what is your opinion on religion generally? Uh, do you think that it's a positive influence in society overall? No, I think it's pretty negative. Um, but people are free to practice whatever, you know, religious tendencies they like. No good is going to come out of forcing people not to be religious. Absolutely no good is going to come of that. People care very deeply about their religious convictions. And who could blame them? What with the, the punishment that's been meted out for those who, uh, who don't? Um, uh, I don't think much of religion personally, and I think that on a philosophical level it can lead people down some really bad roads but if it makes people happy to worship a god or to believe in it then i'm not really in a position to tell them otherwise also how could i convince them not very empirical right uh next questions from wyatt erp what is your view on land value taxation in georgism um i from from what i um from what I've read in it, it seems like um, land value tax and a lot of the principles behind um, Georgism are pretty based. I think I would generally support that. Yeah, um, one of the one of the biggest problems we have infrastructurally in this country, and I guess in the world, is that we um, we do we do not treat land with an appropriate evaluation of its real value. Um, we are incredibly trivial with like land value assessment when it's convenient to us or when it's convenient to say NIMBYs um, and very harsh otherwise. It's very, very frustrating, I think, on a policy level. Uh, have your views over time changed on what should be considered uh, pornography and what should be prohibited? What should be considered? What should be prohibited? Well, I don't think any pornography should, right. pornography should be prohibited unless it violates the law, right? I guess that's um, self-referential, right. right? I mean, I think that I think that right now our obscenity laws in the United States are are fine. Obviously, stuff like child pornography should be banned. I think zoophilia should be banned. Um, that's the only thing I can. Are there any other like major ones? I think that um, I think. Doesn't um, incest pornography tr flag obscenity laws? That's why all the porn companies, they say stepsister, stepmother, stepfather, stepbrother. It's because ob incest can flag obscenity laws, but um, step incest doesn't? That seems a little arbitrary. It's always the same thing. They just say, oh, stepbrother, I'm stuck in this washing machine. Like, it's the same thing, really. Um, but no, I think, I think with regards to the legality of things, I think I'm fine with how things are now. Okay, uh, so I guess just a well, um, you in the past have made some views, uh, I'm sorry, some statements on, uh, child pornography that were considered contentious. Have your views on that changed? Well, the fundamental view that I was making was that, um, uh, child slavery is really bad. So my view on that has remained remarkably consistent. 
Uh, in terms of the uh, ridiculous debate bro ways that I express that argument, challenging people to try to argue otherwise, yes, I'd say that my method of uh, arguing that point has changed significantly. <laughs> I, as, I probably should. Not the most uh, effective way of arguing against child slave. But hey, I guess if anything else, the premise is solid because um, given how uh, people react to that take, it seems like they should really also be opposed to child slavery too, right? Yeah, I, uh, I would hope. <laughs> you would hope, yeah. yeah. So, next question we've got here is from Red. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll see a significant democratic reform from China in the next 50 years? In the next 50 years? That's a tough one. Um, that depends on whether or not... Oh, God, I have no time to get up here. Holy crap. That depends on whether or not um, they backslide into fascism as hard as I have a feeling they're going to. You're already seeing it happening. Um, the Chinese government is very popular with its citizenry in large part because they've secured some massive economic gains. But the economic growth has already started to slow down, like significantly. And there's a lot of cultural enemy developing. China's going to face the same demographic problems, say, America or Germany or Japan have, where you have rising unemployment as automation, uh, automation means that uh, more work's able to be done by fewer and fewer people, the service industry takes over, et cetera, et cetera. All these economic problems are going to happen there, too. I think the Chinese government knows this, which is why they've been leaning into a lot of um, fascistic tendencies lately. If you take a look at some of the rhetoric from the government, and some of this, by the way, is expressly stated in documents that you can get from the CCP, they have been um, essentially undoing the Cultural Revolution. If you remember back in the 1950s, um, Mao, you know, he did his Cultural Revolution, basically deleted hundreds, thousands of years of Chinese cultural history because, uh, you know, our people, oh, sorry, 1960s, not 50s, my bad. Um, you know, people looking forward, you know, as a society, we need to move past the autocrats, monarchs of the past, the emperors, so on and so forth. And the modern Chinese government is undoing that, you know. They're starting to go back to the, like, you know, venerate your people, venerate your history. There was recently a Chinese military ad which showed, like, like, um, like, old Three Kingdoms era Chinese warriors, you know, with, like, the padded armor and spears, like, defend your homeland, reclaim your honor and glory, that kind of stuff. That's really, really weird. Um... Like, can you imagine if, um, if, for example, like, Germany started putting out military ads, and the military ads weren't of, like, modern military, it was, like, of Nordic or, like, Aryan barbarian warriors, like, all blue-eyed and blonde-haired lining up, and it's, like, defend your people, defend the homeland. That's some pretty weird stuff, you know? I think uh, China's gonna backslide hard into fascist autocracy soon. Maybe after that we can get democracy. How cool would that be, huh? Hmm. Uh, do you think a Western democracy is preferable to what we've seen in China, either under Mao or currently? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. No, I would... Yeah. Um, uh, Western Europe, America. Um, these are generally better places to live than like those experiments, 100%. I'm not exactly a big believer in those old socialist projects. What do you call them? State capitalism, like proto-fascism, whatever. I don't think these were wonderful places to live. There are some lessons we can take from them, but for the most part, no, I'd rather live here. So, by the way, would many of the people who lived in those countries. <laughs> Hence the yeah. Berlin Wall. You know, we, we knew where the outflow was coming. Uh, next question is from Conquistador. Uh, they write that to their knowledge... I'm sorry. The question is, to your knowledge, Vosh, hmm? what differentiates class conflict with historical materialism? What differentiates class conflict with historical materialism? Isn't historical materialism the history of class conflict? Because as I understand it, historical materialism is the idea that the material dialectic, the resolution of antagonism between different classes, is the defining like driver in historical development. So class conflict and historical materialism would be uh, you know, overlapping concept there, I think. Um, so there's a good chance I'm also going to get this wrong, but I, I, I might have, I might have misheard. Would you mind, would you mind speaking it one more time? I 
Just want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, no, no, you, you heard the question right. Um, what differentiates class conflict with historical materialism? Um, so I may well be wrong, but I thought uh, that historical materialism was the idea that um, history, people's, you know, social conditions, etc., are determined by their material conditions. Um, yeah, but wouldn't wouldn't class conflict be the um, be be the glue that binds that together? Since class conflict is generally decided to be the determiner of the material conditions of the of the the people throughout history. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, like um. Like, class conflict defines what the life of a proletarian or a member of the bourgeois is today. So class conflict would be the, the tone setter. I, I mean, they're not the same concept, I guess. They just overlap heavily. They're important. Each needs to be understood to understand the, the former, I think. Okay. Maybe I understand here. neither. No, I mean, I don't see how it's possible. <laughs> That's just my understanding. I'm certainly no paleo-Marxist. All right, uh... NPC asks, are you going to debate, um, I'm sorry, are you going to do more socialism debates as opposed to market socialism? You mean like debating people in favor of the socialist position? I think that market socialism is social. I assume you mean like a planned economy or the a complete um, decommodification of industry. That's not something that I like to engage in too much because it feels like it feels like we need to do a lot of legwork first in convincing people of the premises of economic democracy. I feel like that's the next big step that we really need to be concerned with. A lot of people want to skip those points and just go straight to arguing like hard economics. And I don't know if that convinces anyone. Like, when you're talking with a rando, do people really get convinced by economic arguments? I, I don't know if that really ever happens. People's understanding of the economy is so limited that even if you present them an argument that's relatively simple, I feel like like you could talk to a random guy and they'd be like, oh, uh, okay, yeah, um, falling rate of profit. Oh, okay, yeah. Like, This is stuff that appeals, I think, pretty exclusively to policy wonks and contrarians online in terms of convincing people, not in terms of the actual subject material. I'm more interested in the sociological question to convince people to care about economic democracy. Why is it moral that workers should be able to determine, you know, the, the conditions of their workplace? That's what I care about most. And I think it relates to people a little more. It's easier for people to, you know, hear that, apply it to their lives. Uh, so we actually, in the podcast we discussed recently, um, we talked a little bit about unions, and I think for most people in the room, the sticking point was whether or not uh, working at a certain workplace uh, should be required, I guess, if they already have a union there, if they sh uh, should be able to require union membership in order to work there, mm -hmm. um, which I guess goes into right-to-work laws. So I feel I know the answer, but what are your thoughts on right-to-work laws? I... Uh... I'm not a big fan. <laughs> That's, I, I mean, I could explain why, but I feel like you could, you could hear the same arguments against right to work laws from me as you could from literally anyone else left leaning in this country. Um, they're just not good. It's just, uh, it's not good, folks. It's a bad deal. Um, so, hopefully, that. By the way, that's another thing that's tough to argue um, on with people, right? Like getting people to understand the problem with right to work laws. It's not too complicated. I just feel like it's a little more abstract than most people are conditioned to care about. It's also the, the name, that... by the way. The right, like, right to work. Like, it sounds very uplifting, you know? So, one of the things that I found interesting about it, it seems like there's uh, a direct conflict between what feels right, gutturally, for most people, and achieving the right outcome. So, mm -hmm. like, you know... If we, you know, have more people in unions, that's better working conditions for workers, etc. Um, but then a lot of people, regardless of whether or not you think this is true, a lot of people would say that, like, you know, it doesn't feel right that we require a worker uh, to join one. Um, how important is it, like, just like kind of thing about what feels right versus achieving an outcome? Well, it's, I mean, it, it really plays into, like, um, the American... Uh, individual exceptionalism bias we all have, right? Hyper-individualism, like, working together as a group is a sign of personal weakness, that bullshit. The thing is, like, and again, I hope this doesn't come across as too trite or obvious for all my happy communists in chat, but, you know, um, the bourgeois act as a class. 
Very wealthy people know what their class interest is. It is not a mystery to them. They do not spend their lives thinking, I'm a unique individual with no bias towards the general interest of the wealthy. That's why they are so in lockstep when it comes to advocating for positions that benefit them economically. It's the proletariat that are divided on this because we don't know how to work together. We're taught not to work together. Whereas they go to all the same, you know, dinner parties and all the same Epstein Island get-togethers. They know they work together. They know how this works. With the right-to-work laws and with unions in general, people need to understand that deliberately withholding your ability to participate in a union makes about as much sense as signing a waiver that denies you your right to vote in an election in the future. An utterly obscene rejection of your most fundamental and inalienable rights taken away from you for scant or non-existent benefits. Do you have to pay union dues? Sure, you have to pay union dues. But people who work in unions make more money than people who don't. So much more, in fact, that it covers the union dues several times over in almost every case. So why would people not advocate for this? Well, I mean, false consciousness. They don't like the idea of unions becoming popular because they've been taught that we should promote values like autonomy and independence and self-reliance to the exclusion of solidarity. And I suppose it makes them feel, you know, very special when they succeed on their own individual merits. But that's not how human civilization works. Humans, humans do wonderful things collectively, and we always have. So it's just a mindset shift. That's why they got away with such an obscene name as a right-to-work law, you know? That's why they were able to get away with naming it that. Because of all the biases we already have crammed inside of us. Uh, Alex wants you to drop a quick note. Uh, thanks, Vosh, on starting the... Or congrats, Vosh, on starting the Kink App Pride Twitter discourse. Oh, wonderful. Uh, was that Going. you that started that? I didn't start it, but I feel like I was the largest figure. I went trending alongside the term. Um, it was an absolute waste of time, and I encouraged zero people to familiarize themselves with the tenets of that awful discourse. Uh, Orc wants to know, does pineapple belong on pizza? Um, I admit to my bias here. Um, having naturally delicious cum, I've never actually liked or really enjoyed pineapple that much. So, I don't really like pineapple on anything. You'll have to take my biases uh, as they are. Uh, let's see. D uh, question from Z Rose. Do you think rule utilitarianism can exist under act utilitarianism? Um, I think that rule utilitarianism is a subset of act utilitarianism, no? I had this explained to me by, I think, a doctorate in philosophy who came on to chat with me one time while I was playing Resident Evil 2. Essentially, the rule that you normalize through an act is a component of the act. So really, rule and act utilitarianism aren't different, they're the same thing. What you could argue is that people who refer to act utilitarianism as only meaning the specific consequences to that one act outside any broader context, they're not act utilitarians, they're just morons. No one would actually say like, ah yes, my ethical system doesn't account for the consequences of my behavior outside the direct engagements that immediately follow that behavior. Um, so I just go with utilitarian now. But some people say rule utilitarian, rule utilitarian is more clear, so I don't know. I hate language. Uh, next question is from Smelly. Will you run for public office? God, no. Absolutely not. Never. Not in a million years. Uh, next question is from Mango. Um, uh, sorry. How are you going to avoid the mistakes that Destiny made with his canvassing efforts for your canvassing? Um, well, the, the mistake that Destiny made there, being a hate, uh, hated e-boy, as I am, is directly associating with the candidate. I have no such intentions. I will never speak to the candidate that I am canvassing for. I will never speak to them. They will never know my name. They will never hear about me. And because of that, because of a lack of direct connection, nobody can attack my candidate for me canvassing for them. It also helps to go and support bigger candidates. If you're canvassing for a senator, for example, what, you, like, you can't really cancel a senator over that. Like, uh, 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 senator, uh, um, 
in one city in the state, there's the people, there's a YouTuber, a YouTuber, they're not a good YouTuber and they like you. Like, no, of course not. Very difficult um, to cancel somebody over something that trivial, you know? Right, so next question is from Reluctantly. What do you think about abolishing the police? Um, so, as I understood it initially, this was my uh, initial understanding of the subject. I thought that abolish the police was like a broader call for addressing the institutional problems with the police. Like, by abolish the police, we don't literally mean delete the institutions. We mean, like, we need to make it so that the job of the police is done by different agencies, lessen their power, you know, weaken them, so on and so forth. If we actually mean just get rid of the police, like, up front, this is a very white thing to say. Um, and a, a very, very Caucasian argument. No, of course not. We, we do need police right now. We can work to bolster the systems that the police fulfill right now with other institutions. We can defund the police, we can reform, we can address the criminal justice system, but we do need police in some, you know, in some faculties. So this next question is my own, and I understand it may sound dumb, but there's actually, I think, a lot to unpack in this. I'm ready. Um, how do you tell if something is racist? <laughs> Uh, kind of like the differentiation, like, you know, does it have to have some malintent? Uh, can a disparate effect itself be proof of racism? Um, I don't think that intent necessarily has to factor into whether or not something is racist. First and foremost, I think what people need to understand is that um, if I say, like, let's say we're talking my channel. If I say something is racist or somebody did a racist thing, I am not making some hardcore direct moral judgment that they need to answer for and uh, like that uh, upon pain of death, okay? I do not believe that. Um the the thing is we live in a society <laughs> that is very biased in very many ways and an inevitable product of living with those biases and growing up with them is that we're going to internalize some of them and that's going to make us occasionally act out on those biases. That's just part of life. That's that's not something only bad people do. It's not about the worth of the people. It's just about amending bad behavior if possible. So how do you tell if something is racist? Well, the first thing we need to do is stop being so sensitive about it. And I don't mean like black or brown people need to be um, less sensitive about racism. I mean, white people need to be less sensitive about being called out on racism because that's where the real sensitivity is, you know? I think it's okay to be a little bit sensitive about an issue if it's, like, severely affecting your lives and your families and what have you. But some people freak out so, so hard when something is pointed out to be racially biased. And it's like, why? Why can't we just have this conversation? You know? I'm sorry, I didn't answer the question at all, did I? How do you determine if something is racist? Um, I think you, I think you need to analyze the thing that is taking place and determine whether or not it's facilitating or enabling social norms that uh, contribute to racial bias. And that could be the case whether it's institutionally racist or just interpersonally racist, okay? I still think it's racist for black people to be, like, call white people cracker and be super shitty to them. I still think that's racist and bad. Not as necessarily socially destructive as, like, uh, white on black racism because there's not a huge social bias behind it that's bolstered, but I still think it's bad. Okay. Um, some people say things like uh, racism is power plus prejudice. Is there a kind of shorthand um, for what you're trying to describe here? No, because that, that sentiment is super cringe. Um, basically, that sentiment, that argument, was essentially... Oh god, this, I'm coming down hard on this one. I feel like the only reason people say that is because they wanted to be able to say that white people can't be victims of racism, which is super, super cringe to me. Yeah, white people can. There are plenty of white people that exist that have been bullied or discriminated against because of their race. Now, is it even comparable? I mean, is it even close to racism against black or brown or Asian or indigenous people? No, of course not. Not even close. But it happens. Why not just say that there's interpersonal racism and institutional racism? And interpersonal racism is prejudice along racial lines that's done between people. And that's what white people and black and brown people can all experience. And then there's um, institutional racism, which has to be backed by social norms. And that's something white people don't really experience. That's probably the easiest way to say it, right? 
A mouthful, but it makes sense. Every okay, okay. Everyone can be the victim of interpersonal racism. Systemic racism is something that generally only affects minorities. There we go. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, next question we have here is from uh, Pointlesso. Uh, what is Vosh's uh, opinion about the quote re-education camps end quote in China? I'm a very, very outspoken critic of um, of the Chinese Communist Party and of the genocide taking place against the um, the um, Uyghur Muslim people. Uh, Nanimator wants to know what are your views on Castro and Che in Cuba? Um, they did more good than your average faux communist, like, um, state capitalist revolutionary, you know? I mean, they're not like Stalin here. I feel like a lot of people criticize them and throw them all together in the same boat, like Mao and stuff. Castro did a lot of really bad stuff, you know, treatment of gay people, etc., etc. Che Guevara was more defensible, but sometimes he carried his imperialism off the island, and that's not very good. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, it, it's tough to say. There is a lot of credit that people should give Cuba, considering how tenacious it's been in the face of some unbelievable economic hardship. I think that speaks to some strengths of its governments, the kind of strengths that you wouldn't expect from a government under that degree of institutional pressure. So that's good. I haven't really done a full research stream on the stuff they've done before. I imagine that if I did, I would probably say they did a ton of cringe, and some of that cringe was probably an expected reaction given the problems they had to face. You know? All right. Uh, so next question. Uh, what do you think of when you hear the phrase, support the troops? Is this a problematic phrase? Oh, God, yes. Um, nobody, no, support the troops means uh, support the military industrial complex. Nobody actually means support the troops. If people actually meant support the troops, then the support the troops line would be um, thrown out alongside things like fund the um, uh, the veteran affairs office, you know, give them better health care, um, lessen veteran suicide rates, pull people out of military zones so they stop killing themselves out of PTSD. But they never talk about that. That would be supporting the troops. Instead, support the troops means uncritically defend every military engagement America forces its troops to engage in. And that's not supporting the troops. That's just... That's just supporting the states, which, no. Not today. Alright, next question is from Paifu. They write, I heard Vosh say he is for a transitional state. Is he for a state after the revolution? Um, well, communism, Karl Marx didn't really distinguish between communism and socialism. Socialism was just lower form communism, really. The state takes a while to wither away. It's not something that can happen immediately. I don't believe so, at least. So, a state would exist until a state no longer needs to exist, right? And I imagine that even if that state existed in this transitional period, which I believe most people agree kind of needs to happen in some way or another, um, that state would be run a hell of a lot more ethically than the one we live in today. That'd be the goal, I imagine. All oh, right, uh, let's see. Uh, so when talking about, uh, you know, socialism and capitalism and which we should advocate for, does, does your answer to what we should advocate for change based on the material conditions of the country? For example, should we be advocating for market socialism in a third world country versus a first world country? Um... The, uh, the conditions definitely change depending on the material conditions of the country that you're advocating for activity in. Um, the stuff, for example, that America would need to do to move towards socialism is super different than the stuff that, say, Vietnam would need to do or that, I don't know, South Korea would need to do or whatever. Um, I think that market socialism in general is a pretty effective midpoint to this because it, it, it addresses one half of the premises of socialism. You don't have decommodification, but you do have, um, you know, the, um, the worker's state bit. And that's cool. You know, that's something I'm in favor of. But the way you get there will differ from country to country. Uh, question from Tan. Is taxation theft? Uh, no. First of all, theft is a legal term. Um, so the term is taxation theft is kind of self-answering. No, it's not. Theft is a legal term. 
it's clearly not, because it's not illegal. Um, what the real question is, is taxation an unethical um, redistribution of wealth? To which my answer would be no. I think that um, taxes are the price that we have to pay to live in a civilized society. No getting around it. Um, and that we should all be proud uh, that we have the opportunity to pay our taxes because, well, actually, I'm speaking a little bit idealistically here. If we lived in a country that gave a shit about its people, I would believe this. Ideally, we should all be proud to pay our taxes because those taxes can be put towards greater works projects that, um, that help people in ways that the atomization of achievement and wealth distribution could never, ever, ever do. There is no way to design an economy that provides fair outcomes for everyone without some kind of redistributive system. Luck just plays way too much of a hand in people's ability to succeed. Like, for God's sake, if we take, just say, a market economy, just regular old capitalism, you can have two artists of equal skill and equal drive, one of whom becomes wealthy because they land a job, and the other one who doesn't. Because, because what? It could be anything. Maybe they were born in a different city. Is that fair? That two people of equal talent, skill, merit, that one of them should starve and the other should live comfortably just because of, what, circumstance? No, ridiculous. Obviously, that's not fair. And fairness should be the goal here. I mean, fairness is really just another word for ethical outcomes, isn't it? Um, so we want a system that redistributes opportunity and wealth, tries to pair things out as much as possible, so we really are measuring merit, so more than luck. All right, let's see. Uh, next question here is from uh, Dercasium. Uh, what is your view on anarcho-capitalism? Uh, I'd say it's pretty cringe. Give it a solid 9.5 out of 10 on the cringeometer. There, I mean, the, the state is necessary to manage contracts between, um, or at least some kind of government is necessary to manage contracts between citizens and corporations. In the absence of a state or a government to do this, like, what power do you defer to? It really just turns into feudalism again. Um, possibly even worse than feudalism, actually. Because at least under feudalism, there was some kind of central government that benefited from the general well-being of the population. The monarchy. Generally speaking, as a king or a queen or what have you, you did benefit from having a prosperous population because it means they would pay more in their doles and taxes. But with a corporation, they're responsible only for their customers. So, in a way, you would actually produce a worse incentive structure than what you had under feudalism, you know? Which is pretty bad. Alright, so, most of us would probably agree that, I hope at least, that the swastika is a bad symbol and people should not use it in public. I'm glad we agree uh, on that. <laughs> uh, do you feel that the hammer and sickle is also problematic? Well, while I don't like the Soviet Union, and I think the Soviet Union was, um, was fascistic, uh, in its own way, though not in the same way, it was still fascistic, um, I don't think so, no. Because the symbols you wear are a message, um, that you're expressing to the world around you. And when people wear the swastika, there's one basic message they're trying to promote. I want ethnic cleansing. That's, that's basically it, you know. Um... Dress it up however you want. That's what it means if you're wearing a, a swastika in public. That's the message you're trying to send. Um, with the hammer and sickle, though, that's not the case. Even if the government repped by the hammer and sickle was very, very bad, I'd be willing to bet the vast majority of people who fly those colors in public are just using it as a generic symbol for communism. Communism, of course, being the ideological antithesis of autocracy, ethnic cleansing, and everything else the Nazis represented. So... Are the governments both bad? Sure, sure. But in terms of the message people are trying to send, I think they are diametrically opposite. Now, of course, if a person's running around with a hammer and sickle, um, screaming like, you know, we need to gulag the gays, etc., etc., then okay, well, hats off to them, you know. Um, they're being quite upfront with that. Criticize them however you want, but the intent matters with this. All right. Asper97 wants to know... Uh... What do you think of the Final Fantasy series, particularly Final Fantasy VII and the remake? I don't like Final Fantasy. I'm sorry. I think those <laughs> games are all dumb as shit, and I hate turn-based combat. I'm really, really sorry. I want to. I want to be a. I want to be a better man for you, but I can't. I just don't like Final Fantasy games. I also think that, like, man, 
they really have failed to innovate on turn-based combat, haven't they? I know it was, what, Final Fantasy XV that didn't have it? And fourteen was a MMORPG? But, like, the baseline stuff is just not my cup of tea. All right, Bad Taco wants to know, what is your opinion on apologetics for religious questions such as existence of God, morality of God, etc.? Apologetics? Po apologetics? Yeah, it's called apologetics. Like, I mean, I guess the, as I understand it, the in in olden days, you know, uh, you know, to apologize was to kind of like give explanation. So it's people advocating for religion. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't know if there was some other term here that I wasn't familiar with. Um, you mean like if a person's giving apologetics for like the epistemological reasoning of religion, or a person giving apologetics for the actions of the state? Um, or, or of, of, like, an institutionalized uh, body like the church. Um, yeah, he, he's asking just on religion, you know, in favor of religion in general. Oh, I mean, they're pretty dumb. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been to church. I've heard arguments from religious people. They're all pretty irrational. There's no getting around that. The vast majority of people who are religious are so because their parents told them to be religious when they were kids. Like, the arguments you're going to hear are generally... They're either going to be, like... God of the Gaps arguments, where science can't explain X, so really God's the only answer. And, like, shamans were doing that shit a hundred thousand years ago, so that's nothing new. Or, um, or you'll also get, like, um, you'll try to appeal to people in their weakest moments. When people are down, like, um, hurt or grieving, um, this, it's usually, they, like, look for meaning in their lives that they can't necessarily provide with secular reasoning, so they look elsewhere. I think it's actually a really exploitative way of bringing people onto your ideology. Same as a lot of those, like, red pill channels that um, try to appeal to, like, super lonely, suicidal, cultish, depressed gamer incels or whatever. That stuff really bothers me. So, I don't think that's good. There are people who try to make better arguments for religion, but those are the most common ones by far, in my opinion. Uh, has there ever been an argument for religion that at least gave you pause to actually consider it that didn't seem facially bad? Um, well, one of the, there's a, um, there's an online debate bro called Darth Dawkins, uh, who makes an argument that the reason you know God exists is because the Bible provides you the argument for his existence, and the Bible can't lie to you because God would not deny you the righteousness of your sensory perception. And the reason you know that is because the Bible tells you so. And it gets really circular really quickly. And it's basically an exploitation of people who don't understand the necessary preconditions of engaging in epistemological thought. That's a bad argument. Sounds convincing, though, if you haven't heard it before. Um, in terms of the best arguments that you're going to get, I... <laughs> Honestly, I think the God of the Gaps argument is probably the best one that you're going to get. Hey, before the Big Bang, what was there? Like, how did the... How did... How did this happened, you know? Nobody has any explanation. The cosmic background radiation of the universe tells us that there was a grand explosion some 14 billion years ago. Was all matter compressed into a single infinitesimally small point? That's magic. Like, we don't have any explanation for that. That's magic to us. Scientists say they get it, like, in premise, but no. Not really. Was there a whole universe before that? Then why do our current models suggest that the universe is accelerating in its expansion? Is everything truly going to end quintillions of years from now with no more, like, matter in the universe interacting with other matter because of entropy? Where do you go from here? There are a lot of fundamental questions about the universe that I think are out of our grasp. Um, we're never going to be able to understand them, at least not with technology I think I can comprehend, and appeals to the mystery there are probably the most convincing arguments you can get for god i think that's the closest that you can really get it's not necessarily a good argument but i think you can what razzle and dazzle people you know right that does that make like, yeah. sense no that makes sense uh i was just laughing out the only one you you brought up was just circular arguments well, or the only individual, not argument, but yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, if if there were um, <laughs> if there were good logical arguments for religion, then the Enlightenment wouldn't be the turn that started to lead to the spread of agnosticism in the Western world. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a reason for that. 
Uh, so, generally speaking in the world, we are seeing, I guess it's not really a wave, it's kind of like a, a trickling tide of people turning away from religion. And it's not unique to one area, it is around the world. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a few places where, oddly enough, it seems to be expanding. Um, there was a poll I saw that was done just a couple of years ago, and in Russia, um, the number of people associating with the uh, the Russian Orthodox Church is over 70% now. Uh, what do you make of, you know, I guess, counter-movements like that? Like where places where religiosity is growing more common? Yes. Uh, makes sense. Russia's going more overtly fascist, and the Russian Orthodox Church is one of the cultural, like, mainstays of Russian fascism, so... It makes sense to me that things would be heading in that direction over there, right? Um, I don't know. Again, people are free to believe what they want. I'm not here to make, like, logical arguments against the existence of God. I doubt I'd be able to convince anyone anyway. It's a pretty personal matter. Um, if people care about it so much that they, you know, want to practice the faith, that's fine. I would rather focus on the policy-based arguments that tend to come from that. If you're religious, that's your problem. If you try to ban abortion, that's my problem. So I'd rather, like, deal with those arguments a little more, you know? All right. Uh, Tan asks, why do you support libertarian socialism even after Catalonia used the labor camps and experienced high inflation? Um, because I, because if I allowed the successes and failures of previous governments to dictate my political beliefs, then I would have no political belief. I mean, how can you be a capitalism after the hundreds of millions of people who starved and died in like British controlled India, you know, like how can you be an X? How can you be a Y? I think that there are systemic challenges that can be addressed with a lot of forethought and a lot of care and time, and I don't think the problems in Catalonia are, like, essential problems to libertarian socialism. Most of the problems that get ascribed to capitalism or to socialism usually have more to do with authoritarianism than anything. Um, I would argue, though, that socialism, if done correctly, is inherently democratic, and capitalism is inherently undemocratic because of the way of you know, the autocratic... Um, organization of its economy. So if we're really looking for anti-authoritarianism here, that's the argument for socialism, in my humble opinion. Also, chat, where do you find Koopa the Quick? I'm looking all over for him, and I don't see him anywhere here. Can I get some help? Sorry, just... Koopa? I'm playing, um, Super Mario 64. Oh, right. Sorry, yeah, yeah, Mario. Top of the mountain? Okay. Let's all look. Oh, you can continue, Hera I was would... just asking. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, you can continue, I was just asking. Uh, Hera, uh, I would like to know, is freedom intrinsically good? Um, I would argue yes, if for no other reason than because you can have the freedom to limit your options down the road. Um, freedom is the only way by which you can enact your will, and if your will later becomes, hey, we should probably have less choice in this regard, that's the only way you can really do it. Sometimes humans suffer from choice, you know. Humans don't like it very much when there are 87 options, all of which are equally good, that they have to choose between. They'd rather choose among five. Um, that's just how people seem to be. Oh, uh, here we go. Thank you. Uh, which is a little bit weird when you think about it. Oh, humans don't like choice? Humans don't like freedom? Well, no. Sometimes choices, their availability or their absence, can be beneficial or detrimental. But the freedom to decide how many choices we should have, this is something critical. You know? Huh? Uh, so, we're uh, about an hour in, uh, as I understand. We're still good for another 30 minutes? Uh, yeah, certainly. Alright. Uh, so, hey, if you guys are enjoying this and you're not for somehow familiar with Vosh, please, you can literally just Google V-A-U-S-H, and it'll come up. Uh, check out his YouTube, check out his Twitch. Uh, and if you guys are enjoying this also, if you're not new to us, uh, check us out, discord.gg slash bluepolitics, and newly twitch.tv slash bluepolitics. Next question we have here is from Mango. How would you deal with people who try to justify things like homophobia or transphobia using the Bible? Um, <laughs> honestly, it's it's you're never actually going to be able to sway these people in my experience the best thing that you can start doing is using like passages from the quran um to to start invalidating things they care about 
like if they like once we once we accept that if you accept the idea that like religious doctrine should decide what political freedoms people have then all right it's on like donkey kong i guess and we can just run down a list and go on and on and on and yell at them and scream at them and make a big show out of it but the people who engage in that behavior don't actually change their mind. That's some, like, grade-A bullshit, if you're actually trying to justify things that way. Most religious people have the decency to lie and pretend they have a real reason to dislike gay people, you know? Most of them, they'll be like, uh, uh, the kids, uh, I don't know, it's not healthy, uh, whatever. They'll, like, lie and pretend. In reality, it's because of the religious dogma, but they have the decency. They know that's not a good argument. The people who just go straight to the fundamentalist, my Bible says so, so that's how it's gonna be, type deal, those people are beyond help. Right. Uh, this was a debate going around a little while ago. Should people stop using the N-word altogether? You mean, like, including black people, or are we... Yes. Um, this, I saw this debate. This is a complicated one, okay? So... First of all, I think it's kind of a dumb question because it's not going to happen. Um, it's, it's, it would be like, should people stop murdering? I guess, but does that... It, it, it seems like we're side-skipping the actual, um, the actual question here. Not to say that saying the N-word is like murdering some people. Um, the real question is, like, to what extent can use of the N-word be justified within society without it causing, like, social harm? Now... I'm of the opinion that a perfect society is one in which there is no racial bias, and therefore, there is no language which furthers racial bias, you know? Um, there were probably a bunch of really horrific slurs that Romans used to use against barbarians. Do those words have any meaning now? No. In fact, they've been lost to time. We don't even use them or know what they are anymore. Because it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't ha it, it's completely disconnected from people's actual experiences. And that's great. I, I like that very much. With the N-word, I guess I'm cheating a little bit here by saying we should get rid of racism, which seems equally um, difficult to immediately propose. Um, no, I don't think that everyone should stop saying it, in large part because the attempt to enforce that kind of behavior would probably lead to the normalization of a bunch of new, worse behaviors. Um, it would lead to substitutes. Like, how are you going to police that in the black community, you know? Like, like how, how does that even work? I'm a white guy. If a black guy says, like, the N-word with a soft A near me, should I be like, hey, no, we're all giving up that word, remember? Like, how would that even happen? It just seems like a weirdly utopian project to me, and if we're going to go utopian, we might as well just delete racism anyway. All right. I mean, I'm behind that. All right, let's see. Direction asks... How do you think we should combat global climate change uh, internationally and nationally, separately? Jesus Christ. Um, well... <laughs> uh, well, there are a couple of obvious ones. Um, internationally, obviously, we all need to work together to finance green energy and provide political and economic and trade incentives for countries that are willing to meet certain carbon emission reduction goals. Oh god, this level's hard. Um, that's one. Um, for two, we should probably make an effort to punish countries that don't do that. And for three, we should probably invest in the developing world to allow them to better develop their green energy, as opposed to just, like, letting them sort it out domestically. Domestically, there are a number of things we can do. We can promote and prioritize the development of green energy and nuclear energy. Um, we can go even further uh, by um, redesigning our cities to cut down on individual car use. Uh, we can incentivize public transport. We can incentivize work standards that allow people to work from home more often, which cuts down on overall energy usage. Um, we can design homes to um, emit less heat. We can... Uh, encourage the use of more eco-friendly building supplies. We can plant more trees. We can... There are so, so, so many things we can do. And to an extent, all of these things are already being done. We just need to do them much, much more. Uh, next question. What do you think about the recent announcement of the new superhero, Iron Dome? <laughs> Yes, the, the Israeli superhero fighting for truth and justice, etc., etc. Um, 
I think it's a wonderful component to the broader argument leftists make that superheroes are usually used as a cultural stand-in for fascism. You know? A big, strong, mighty individual who represents state hegemony by fighting against the, you know, not institutional problems, but rather the criminal expressions of institutional problems. Um, wonderful, that. Probably worth a segment, actually, now that I think about it. But yes, not good. Huh. Like, I, I, I haven't actually heard that point before. Like, just offhand, can you give me a few examples that seem to suggest that? Yeah, sure. So, the problem is that, um... How do I... How do I put this? Um, superheroes in archetypical media represent the ultimate good. They are perfectly selfless people. Even, like, Marvel heroes who have personal flaws, like Peter Parker, for example, or Miles Morales, are, like, unbelievably um, kind and generous and giving heroes. And that's good. The problem is, is that the mythology of the superhero tends to twist the narrative around that kindness and generosity, rather than it being a symbol of people rising up to solve the world's problems, it's usually just an expression of hegemony being personified through a caricature, a masked hero who's meant to be an approachable mascot for the values of this broader society. Take, for example, you know, Batman and Superman and what have you, you know. Do these people, do they go and fight um, against climate change? Sometimes in the good comics, sure. But historically, most of the time, they fight like bank robbers and supervillains. And the supervillains are themselves often cartoonish depictions of deviancy, you know? Of mental illness, of poverty, of violence. But these things don't emerge in and of themselves, they're a product of a flawed society. But very rarely is that flawed society ever actually challenged. In the Superman comics, especially from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, Metropolis is almost a utopia. It's a utopia with boils and blisters, ones that he, Superman, stamps down on. But he doesn't really fix the fundamental issues behind them. Does that make sense? It's a, um, it's a way of moving, um, people's priorities off of the right positions. What is the ultimate good? What do heroes do? Do they fix the fundamental institutional problems with power and control? Well, no. They act like police officers, except stronger and more handsome. This makes sense, right? So I'm not trying to argue with you, but I, I'm just not understanding. Like, so I, I, I do understand the issue that's being raised here with the superheroes, right? So like Batman fights, you know, crime. Wait, you yeah, cut out. Wait, 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 wait. You, you oh. cut out. Batman fights crime? Oh, yeah, yeah. So Batman fights crime, um, but often those people who are committing the crime, they're doing it because of the conditions they're in. They're trying to put food on a table for someone, right? And we don't get that. We just get Batman fight the criminal, and he's not trying to get at the underlying causes for the crime. Have you, um, ha have you ever read The Dark Knight Returns? Read it? No. Spe then you've watched the animated one. Uh, I'm being careful here. I think I have, but I get a lot of the Dark Knight stuff mixed up. So. It's okay. It's um, it's a, a a Frank Miller back in the 1980s. He wrote this comic, okay? And this to me is archetypical Batman. It's the most honest Batman ever made. Do you mind if I describe it to you briefly? Yeah. So, in The Dark Knight Returns, he's retired about 20 years ago. Batman, I mean. And Gotham has fallen to shit. Crime runs rampant, but he remains retired. The broader government, America in general, has gotten more authoritarian, more controlled. It's no longer led by Democrats and leaders and what have you. It's led by autocrats and G-men from the feds. And now, you know, Bruce, he sees his, his city falling apart, and he thinks, I'm the one who can put this back together. I will put this back together. And what follows is essentially his reunion tour. A, um, a, a slideshow of, of, of him reconfronting the horrors of his past and trying to fix Gotham. And the way in which he does it is so evidently fascistic in so many ways, you know? 
the old villains he used to fight against have been coddled and sanctioned by the effeminate, liberal, psychiatric nanny state. The Joker has been relabeled a victim of Batman's psychosis. Individual responsibility doesn't exist anymore in The Dark Knight Returns, so Joker isn't blamed for the many people he killed. It's Batman's fault. The same way people will say, rather than blaming, you know, the crimes on criminals, they blame it on police and the military-industrial complex and the criminal justice system. Um, Joker, of course, goes back to killing. He's heavily gay-coded in, you know, his clash with the very heterosexual Batman, big and square-jawed. And I mean, it all culminates in this big scene towards the end where Batman is leading people together to put out fires in Gotham after it's been hit with an EMP nuke. And um, Commissioner Gordon is looking at Batman, who's giving orders from atop a horse. And Gordon goes on this monologue where he says that Batman is so greater a creature than he is, so morally superior, that he, as a common man, doesn't even have the right to judge his actions. Um, that, to me, is the ultimate and most honest take on Batman. He's a man who challenges the idea of criminological analysis. The villains that he fights are just bad people. They're evil and crazy. They're scum. And Batman's not afraid to say that. He'll say it pretty overtly. What's the thing he says? Are, are criminals still cowardly and weak and fearful? That's why I am what I am? It's not sociological. It's about him, the masculine archetype, the caped crusader, fighting against the degenerates in the city in which he lives. He's challenged by the state because the state is too weak and effeminate to know what needs to be done. The police are too weak to accept his methods. He brutalizes, he tortures, he engages in vigilante action. Not just because he knows what's right, but because he's the only one strong enough to do what needs to be done. The underlying cultural threads beneath superheroism are very, um, well, they're worth looking into at the very least. It's not like all superheroes are fascists. It's just, it's not a coincidence that the archetype of the Ubermensch is very popular amongst fascists. The idea of a morally superior being who uses their strength to guide society in the direction they believe is just. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, I just completely rambled there. This is like video essay no, stuff, no, and I'm trying to like. Rambling. That actually makes sense. Okay, sorry. I said this is pro. I, I feel like I'm doing a disservice to this a little bit, but that's the that's my thought in it, basically. No, that's helpful. That that actually does make sense. All right. Well, cool. Um, it, it feels like a profound conversation, but I gotta remember we're talking about. I would need to write here. stuff um, down. It's it's a whole it's a whole thing, but. <laughs> Anyway, yes, you should read the uh, Dark Knight Returns. By the way, it is a lovely comic. Um, by lovely, I mean it's very, it's it's very well written. Um, politically, I think it's actually quite odious, but it's fun to look at and analyze at least. Um, when you see things like that in comic books or other media, um, how often do you feel like the the kind of uh, political point? that's being drawn out was intended by the author? Um, often I don't think it's something they intended to do. People wildly overestimate how apolitical media is. People will make stuff that is so biased and they will deny its political um, underpinnings, which is very, very funny. Um, like, you see how gamers talk about video games, yes? You know, like, oh, The Last of Us wasn't political until they added lesbians in the second game. That type stuff? Very, very silly. Um, people just aren't that good at media analysis in general, so... And that applies to the authors, too. That's not just the people who, um, who actually consume the media. Alright, next question we've got here. Uh, what do you think of ACAP? A all, the, uh, all cops are bastards? Yes. I think it's effective at getting people riled up, but if your understanding of and analysis of um, police begins and ends with ACAB, I'd say it's a very flawed understanding. Sometimes protests have to be sung to a tune that's a little bit more hyperbolic um, than a proper analysis should allow. Like, for example, back during the Civil Rights Movement, what do they shout? No justice, no peace. They still shout that. Now, is that literal? 
Do they literally mean no justice, no peace until we get what we want? Do they go around like murdering and raping people? Well, no, of course they don't. They don't literally mean no justice, no peace. They mean that it can't be achieved. The conversation is nuanced. The slogan is simple. A cab is a slogan. Don't let you know that be the beginning and end of your understanding of the issue. All right, and Sticky writes that they want to start reading and getting into political theory. Um, where would you suggest that they start? Oh, God, I'm the worst person. If, if you want a, a, a really good, like, intro course on hard theory, you should take a look at the channel Radical Reviewer. I'm friends with the person who runs that channel. He does good stuff there. Um, the only theory that I've read twice now is State and Revolution, which I found quite formative. Um, of course, that's from Lenin, who did a lot of cringe stuff later in life, so, you know, you're gonna have to take it all with a, a grain of salt, but, yeah. I, th I think that's pretty good. I mean, a con um, you know, the Bread Book is good, obviously. People speak often of that. I have never read Capital. Um, that is a lot of words that my ADHD-rattled brain is not not willing to commit to at this time. Uh, maybe I will in the future. We'll have to see. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Just uh, have fun with it. Don't force yourself to read something you don't find interesting. Because if you do, you won't retain any of it. All right, Dan the Man asks, what strategy should we use to bring socialism to America? <sighs> well, I think the best bet is probably hamming on the worker democracy angle, you know? Take advantage of economic crises and global climate change to push hard against the idea that capitalism is really securing people's best interest. Fight like hell to uh, popularize the idea of like democratic socialism, Bernie Sanders type stuff. Um, and essentially bait corporations and autocrats into um, getting more mask off with their authoritarianism. The harder they go to prevent people from engaging in class consciousness, the easier it'll be to condemn them after the fact. Basically, that's the gist of it. Secure a strong working labor movement, you know, all that fun stuff. All right. Uh, that robot writes, hello, I heard you support nuclear energy. Why do you support nuclear energy despite its high cost and efficiency and the fact that there are viable alternatives? Um, I don't because I don't think that it necessarily has a high cost, uh, low efficiency with lots of uh, strong alternatives. It's actually quite efficient um, in terms of the waste generated. I mean, it's. Uh, infinitesimally small per uh, kilowatt hour produced than you would get from any other type of non-renewable energy. Um, so that's cool. And with regards to its expense, it's true that it takes a long time to set up these facilities, but I mean, it seems to me from everything that I've read that they pay dividends quite a bit in the long term. It's been a while since I've reviewed the data on it, but it's something that I've I think is generally considered to be pretty, you know, favorable. And it's safe, too, you know? People talk on and on about how dangerous nuclear is. Nuclear is scary. I mean, I'll give it that, but it's not really dangerous. Not if it's handled even remotely responsibly, as it should be. Um, not trying to suggest it is dangerous, just it's vaguely related. Have you seen the HBO series Chernobyl? Yes, I have. Um, it should be noted that every time there's been a nuclear disaster, it's usually because somebody fucked up somewhere. Now, fucking up is a part of the human condition. We can't keep people from fucking up. That's always going to happen. But I think that with a broader cultural investment in nuclear energy, we could go, you know, we could, we could do a lot towards making these facilities safe and easy to set up. They're really not too dangerous. Um, especially modern facilities. You know, the old, I'm no nuclear engineer, but the old nuclear facilities were really primitive compared to what people do today. The risk for a nuclear power plant is, of course, a meltdown, you know, that the fusion reaction taking place scales beyond control, things overheat, and safeguards fail to activate, which allows um, the critical mass uh, past the point of the... Um, the reactors like safety protocols to be reached and at that point you have a spillover but the extent to which that can cause damage is limited by the containment of the fuel rods and the way in which they um the reactions are catalyzed 
it used to be, um, did I say fusion? Sorry. Um, it used to be that, um, if I'm being very simplistic here, the, um, the nuclear material was all kept together in like a big lump, or at the very least, it was easier for there to be crossover in this reaction. But nowadays, all the, like, it's all kept like separate and atomized, meaning that a nuclear meltdown would be, um, way less destructive now than it would have been in the past, I think. Does that make sense? Wait, guys, am I... Is what I'm saying... Wait, does anyone in chat have an engineering degree? This is basically correct, right? That the way they organize the fuel rods now means it's much, much, much harder for there to be a critical, like, chain reaction, I think? Yeah. I think so. Okay. Okay, they're saying that I'm right, so... <laughs> okay, that's good, I guess. Uh, I thought so, just to make sure. Uh... Let's see here. Rebel Trader would like to know, do you support lowering the voting age? If so, how far? Um, that's an interesting one. Um, I could, I could be, I could be amicable to that. Yeah, I, I think so. I used to think no, because like kids are too stupid to really understand how the government works or how to participate in it. But now I realize adults are also really, really stupid. So that doesn't seem like a fair reason to exclude kids, you know? I don't know, I guess I'd have to think about it. Maybe raise the voting age. Have to be 50 <laughs> year old or something like that. Have to have an AARP membership card. Having spoken to 50 year olds, I'm afraid my opinion on them is pretty much the same. I, the, the older <laughs> I get, the, so kids are more cringe, but in terms of general intelligence, I actually don't think adults are really that much smarter than kids are. They're more mature, which means they're better at, like, managing life decisions and risk-reward. But in terms of, like, abstract analysis of, say, political problems, I actually don't think adults are any more rational than kids are, you know? Um, it, it seems like adults and kids both fall into the same cognitive biases when it comes to political stuff like that. To, or to, to put it, to put it um, another way, you know, I think I would trust a 16-year-old to vote, but I don't think I would trust a 16-year-old to, like, um... Um, what's the thing that a kid probably shouldn't do? Like, go on a vacation on their own? Well, fly to an airport on their No, I'm trying to think of a good example. What's something, like, a wouldn't try? I was gonna say drive alone. Uh, buy a house. Um, sign a contract. There you go. Yeah. I wouldn't trust a 16-year-old to sign a contract, but I would trust them to vote, I think. Because a contract has more to do with, like, individual risk and reward, personal bias, incentive. Um... Words with voting, everyone's stupid. So, <laughs> who cares, right? Uh, Witchblade would like to know, if we're up to you, how would you approach trying to render the Republican Party politically irrelevant? Ah, my, my favorite talking point. Um, the obvious one is getting rid of the Electoral College. Uh, there's just no reason. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It's just a handicap for the Republican Party. That's it. It just, it does not do what it's supposed to do. The Electoral College was originally about getting um, presidential candidates to pay more attention to every state instead of just going to, like, the biggest ones. It does not work. People only go to swing states, so that just does not function. Um, we need to get rid of that. Obviously, you know, uh, making voting easier, expanding um, mail-in voting to the best extent we can, enfranchising, redistricting, maybe even mandatory voting, which I've heard a lot of positive arguments for. If you don't like any candidate, you can just show up and vote for, like, Sir Poop and Fartin, you know, like with the write-in. Um, whatever works, I suppose. But there are a lot of things that can be done. The more democratic this country becomes, the weaker the Republican Party becomes. Simple as that. Um, so I know this is a question you probably haven't really heard that often, so I wouldn't mind explaining if you need me to. Um, what are your thoughts on the Israel-Palestine issue? <laughs> Um, it is ultimately the Israeli government that has the power in this situation. They are the massive military power, backed by the United States. They are the industrialized nation. God damn it. Um, so it is up to them to resolve this problem. They are the ones with the greatest potential to exacerbate the problem or to fix the problem. Simple as that, you know. Like, what do you expect the Palestinians to do? If they, if they just gave up and were like, okay, we'll be super peaceful from now on, they're just going to keep having their land annexed illegally by Israel. 
It's just the they even if the the Palestinian people could magically like be as peaceful as is possible for them to be, that wouldn't fix the problem. Whereas if the um if the Israeli government said, "Hey, we'll return to like 1948 borders or whatever," uh, on the condition that there's a ceasefire and the political disbandment of Hamas, I think I think that the Palestinians would readily accept that deal. In my humble opinion. All right, so we got just three minutes left. Um, looking forward here, uh, obviously there's a primer for the debate next Saturday. Uh, what are your thoughts on income inequality, and is it a problem? Um, I'd say it's pretty cringe, but the, are you kidding me? Sorry, this, this goddamn game. Um, I'd say it's pretty cringe, but income inequality is actually the wrong thing to focus on. The thing that we actually should focus on is quality of life, and we should focus on uh, accessibility to life opportunities. If two people make different amounts of money, but they both have like roughly comparable life opportunities, I really do not care. In, in a country where a person who makes $50,000 a year has the ability to enjoy life to its fullest with vacations and ready accessibility to healthcare, I would not really care that much about a person making $200,000. Um, now, obviously, the way to secure the freedom of the former person would by, be by taxing the latter person quite hard. And, and that's um, just tends to be how wealth redistribution works. But fundamentally, the inequality of wealth isn't so much what I care about. It's power um, and the ability to use it. Right. So, yeah, anyone that hasn't heard yet, I'm really excited for this next Saturday at 8 eastern standard time uh we're excited to be hosting debate between vosh and euron bro i you know it's a really weird thing his name's spelled y-a-r-o-n but the only way i can remember to say it right is to think of the character from game of thrones uh the Greyjoy. pretty uh pretty cool but, uh, character. <laughs> but yeah really excited for that 8 p.m uh, Eastern on Saturday. Uh, they're going to be discussing income inequality. And uh, Euron Brook, he's the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute. So should it the least bit be interesting? Um, and uh, yeah, um, right after that, uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure what you got going on right after that, but we're going to be starting. Um, it was actually, we, we thought of this after seeing your stream that how well it went um uh, we we're gonna start a uh 24 hour charity stream trying to support osd operation supply drop uh they you know do a lot to help veterans uh homeless uh help people reintegrate um you know support the troops that kind of thing <laughs> but, yeah uh, that's uh, uh extremely poggers uh make sure to keep me updated on that over discord okay yeah, will do. So, um, thank you for coming on, and I look forward to seeing you next Saturday, man. Yes, very much so. And take care. You too, man. Bye.